Earliest it appears to be a previously unknown variant of the 40 suspected case catching many experts off guard. Today I was feeling like maybe I was... Back on the breaking news, leading with unconfirmed reports of a, a smallpox small outbreak. outbreak is a highly rehearsed scenario. And National Guard units converging no on a hospital trains. in Central The bridges Manhattan. are closed. It's smallpox is a very real more danger. More than AIDS, more than a There's bowl. not enough vaccines. No. Let me stop you there. This is not a panic situation. Smallpox is an acute, contagious viral disease that is estimated to have resulted in 300 to 500 million deaths throughout history. The initial symptoms include fever and vomiting. This is then followed by the formation of sores in the mouth and a skin rash. Over a number of days, the skin rash turns into fluid-filled bumps with a dent in the center. The bumps then scab over and fall off, leaving scars. The disease is spread between people or via contaminated objects. The risk of death after contracting the disease is about 30%, with higher rates among babies. Often those who survive have extensive scarring of their skin, and some are left blind. The earliest evidence of the disease dates back to the 3rd century BC in Egyptian mummies. In 18th century Europe, it's estimated that 400,000 deaths per year were because of the disease. And as recently as 1967, 15 million cases were reported in a single year. Following this, the World Health Organization intensified its efforts to eliminate the disease. The last naturally occurring case was diagnosed in October 1977, and the World Health Organization certified the global eradication of the disease in 1980. One of the last cases of smallpox occurred in Birmingham, United Kingdom in 1978. A medical photographer contracted the disease at the University of Birmingham Medical School and died on the 11th of September 1978. All known stocks of the smallpox were subsequently destroyed or transferred to two World Health Organization designated laboratories. The United States Center for Disease Control and Prevention and the Russia's State Research Center of Virology and Biotechnology. The World Health Organization first recommended destruction of the virus in 1986, but this kept getting postponed due to resistance from the US and Russia. In 2002, the World Health Assembly agreed to permit the temporary retention of the virus stocks for specific research purposes. In the division, we're introduced to the virus well after it's taken hold of New York City and has spread to other parts of the world. It shows all of the usual characteristics of smallpox, except for a couple of quite major differences. Firstly, it managed to spread among the population long before any symptoms started to show. And secondly, the mortality rate was considerably higher. The smallpox virus was nothing like the virus we've seen through history. It was some new variation, some sort of new superbug. But where did it come from? And why now? And this is where I introduce you to the man behind it all, Dr. Gordon Amherst. Amherst was a calm, collected man, but he had a reputation as being a controversial and dangerous individual even before the outbreak of the dollar flu. He would practically cause riots at lectures he would hold, and was otherwise considered an unpopular figure by virologists like Dr. Jessica Kendall. Gordon Amherst is the man behind the creation and outbreak of the dollar flu. His reasoning for creating and spreading the green poison was that humanity was too powerful on a global scale, and Mother Nature needed help in advancing her creations. Mankind is the greatest threat to the survival of the planet through their own greed, but he had the cure. Amherst also had a Darwinist point of view, only the strong deserve to live, and his creation is the tool to ensure that this happens. But at the same time, he is willing and accepted that his death may come from his own creation. Gordon Amherst was friends with Vitaly Tinenko and worked with him in Russian labs. Through this friendship, he had access to genetic libraries of many different pathogens, as well as Vitaly's research notes. He was able to modify the basic smallpox virus by combining it with several other dangerous diseases like Ebola and H1N1. On top of this, he also modified the genetic traits that controlled the incubation period and made it so that it could even spread while it was incubating in the host. This made it particularly lethal, because by the time that the host was showing symptoms, it had already spread to a significant number of others. Using a protein printer, Amherst was able to create the final form of his virus just in time for Black Friday, one of the United States' busiest retail days of the year. His plan was to spread this new virus via means that were most in contact with people during the shopping holiday. Money. Hence the name, the dollar flu. Before it was realized that it was smallpox, people took the epidemic for just a particularly bad version of the annual flu. Also, because medical personnel got sick too, the medical infrastructure quickly collapsed. Even once smallpox was discovered to be the base strain of the virus, the modifications made to it had known vaccinations rendered useless when it came to the treatment of the sick. The people capable of researching and developing a cure were likely also infected, 
making it difficult for an organised effort to be made. The lack of quarantine, treatment and the changes made to the virus ultimately led to the dollar flu being as widespread and lethal as Amherst had intended it to be. The main target that Amherst had in mind for the beginning of the end of mankind was New York department store, Abel's. Being that it was Black Friday, Abel's was filled with eager shoppers ready to take advantage of the specials. Echo recordings show Amherst among the shoppers handing over contaminated bills to the cashiers. These were the first victims of the dollar flu. From here, the bills transferred to multiple shoppers within Manhattan, and within hours, the airport, and then the rest of the world. It was from this point that we lose track of Dr. Gordon Amherst. He just vanished. Perhaps he was sitting back watching the chaos unfold. The second wave division agent's number one priority was to find Amherst before any more damage could be done, and have him explain what he did, and how to stop the disease. Eventually, Amherst's fate is found. Only a short time into the outbreak, Amherst succumbs to his own creation. His body is found in an apartment building only a few hundred yards from the outpost on the Hudson River, where the second wave agents first arrive in Manhattan. However, the agents weren't the first ones to find him. Aaron Keener was one step ahead, and along with Amherst's research notes, protein printer, and Vitaly Tenenko as his hostage, he disappeared. Fun fact, Gordon Amherst's name does have some sort of historical relevance. Geoffrey Amherst was a British field marshal and a commander-in-chief during the 1700s, and governor of the English and French territories that would later become Canada. There are a number of achievements that he's recognised for, but there's one in particular that links him to the Dr. Amherst that we know in the division. In 1763, there was a rebellion where a number of Native American tribes joined together and led an assault on the British. During this time, there was an outbreak of smallpox in the fort, and it was Amherst that came up with the suggestion of using the outbreak against the sieging tribes. He actioned this by having smallpox infected blankets fall into the hands of the native tribes. In 1780, Amherst was in charge of the British army that was involved with suppressing riots in London. Because of the way the situation panned out, Amherst was forced to resign as Commander-in-Chief. This particular situation is known through history as the Gordon Riots. Okay, so hopefully you've enjoyed that and maybe learnt a thing or two. I'll be back next week with a video on, well, I haven't actually completely decided yet. If you have any suggestions, let me know in the comments. Cheers! What you're looking at is the smallpox virus, one of the deadliest pathogens on the planet. For centuries, it did a wonderful job of helping keep the human population in check. But times change, and sometimes Mother Nature needs a hand in improving her creations. Like, say, speeding them up a little bit, making them contagious when they should be quietly incubating in a host, or making them more lethal. I didn't come up with the approach on my own. My friend Vitaly is one of the pioneers in the field, and the idea has been around for years. Genome as data. You see, once we digitized DNA, we made it infinitely mutable. We could do a thousand virtual variations in the time it used to take to grow a one lab grade generation of pathogens. And we could pick the best, most lethal combinations and make them real. That's how you make a killer virus, you see. Mix in genetic code from other diseases, and you move the sliders all the way up on lethality and virulence. The goal was a 90% mortality rate. I'm not sure my green poison is going to quite hit that, but honestly, that's just details. As long as most of humanity goes, the Earth stands a fighting chance. Technically, technology is what's killing the planet. But that's not really the case. It's the greed that drives the technology. But a funny thing happened on the way to $100 genome maps and 3D printed plastic toys. Someone figured out those technologies could be repurposed, modified for the greater good. Me. Now, my virus is gonna do what nature's always done. Decide who lives and who dies. And if nature decides I die, then I die. If nothing else, I'll have a lot of company. Natural selection at its finest. Helped along by a little unnatural genetic manipulation. 
It's all data, really. Life's just a method of processing it. The same way I processed the smallpox genome on my laptop. And who's to say that wasn't the plan all along? If, by some miracle, you survive green poison, then nature's decided you deserve to live. The rest of us shouldn't and won't. Godspeed. I'll see you in hell.